Bishop Caggiano has emphasized the special role that beauty can have, especially in today's society, in drawing people back to faith. Anyone, whether you have faith or not, can be deeply moved by nature's majesty or a piece of great music or the cathedral at Chartres. And yet, Pope Francis said, every expression of true beauty is a path leading to an encounter with the Lord Jesus. So, our bishop has established the Guild of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus to bring beauty back to the community and to the diocese in many ways, and in doing so, to reinvigorate the faith through beauty. Father Michael Clark is the rector of the Guild and the oratory that was established alongside it. He's our guest today on Let Me Be Frank. Keep listening on 1350 AM and 103.9 FM or on the Veritas mobile app on your phone. If you don't yet have the app, go right now and get it from the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or VeritasCatholic.com. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from our wonderful sponsor, Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network, starring Bishop Frank Caggiano. I am Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce His Excellency. Starring? What an interesting concept. (laughs) Steve, it's good to see you, my friend. And we have a great topic today to talk about. Tell us what it is. Really fantastic. So you have spoken often about the transcendentals. And um, those, of course, for our listeners are truth, goodness, and beauty. And uh, you speak often about how beauty in particular can draw people, especially in today's society, uh, it has the ability to move people and draw them to the faith, even Mm -hmm. when they don't realize that it's happening. Mm -hmm. And so today's guest has a particularly important role in this diocese to bring beauty back to the community in many ways and to reinvigorate the faith through beauty. So he is, of course, Father Michael Clark. Father Clark was born and raised in the United Kingdom, and what a curriculum vitae. He has a master's in theology from Cambridge University. He studied for and was called to the bar in 2008 and practiced law as a barrister for five years. At the same time, he was singing professionally at Exeter Cathedral and later moved to Buckfest Abbey as the director of music. As a seminarian then, when he discovered his vocation, he ended up visiting the Diocese of Bridgeport in 2016, and he looked around and he saw how beautiful Connecticut is. That's my own interpretation of that. Um, and, uh, and how great the people are. And this part is true. He began discerning a call to serve here. And so, uh, Father, you were ordained uh, in the Diocese of Bridgeport in October 2019. And today you serve as rector of the Guild of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, which we'll learn more about today on the show. Father Michael Clark, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be with you. Thank you. What a remarkable journey you have lived. It's you been know, quite exciting, Bishop. Yeah, and unexpected in many ways. Very. So everyone gets the same question to begin. So mm. tell us a bit about your journey of faith. Well, that's quite complicated in my case. I was born into a family where the faith was certainly a strong part of it, part of the DNA, but I was not born into a Catholic home. My parents were... Anglicans in the Church of England, and we were brought up as practicing Anglicans. And I think something happened in the United Kingdom between the 1980s to the 1990s, because practice in the Church of England really just fell apart. And we were at the beginning a church going family, and then suddenly we were not a church going family anymore. But at the very same time, I was introduced to choral music. My mother had heard about the possibility of boys getting choral scholarships to go and sing in the Anglican Cathedral. It's a great tradition in England. And she thought that that might be a good idea for me. So sent me 
to the cathedral. So there was I in this beautiful medieval building, exposed to the richness of choral music, the Anglican tradition, the English tradition of singing, but also the architecture of the building. It was built from the 12th century onwards up to the 14th century. And you can't fail to be inspired by that kind of environment. And I think, I suppose, God is has been knocking at my door since the earliest days. I didn't really realize it, and I tried everything else um, before A, coming to faith, and, and then B, recognizing that he was calling me to be a priest. None of that was ever in my mind when I was growing up. But here I am. It's, uh, it's been quite a journey. Right. It's, it's, your story is illustrative of many priest stories that God led them in unknown ways at the beginning, even in my life. But obedience is the key. Your willingness, ultimately, to listen to what he has to say and the generosity that you had to say yes, and then everything else unfolded, right? Even coming to the United States, which I presume at the beginning was not on your radar to not serve in, here in the United States. Not in the least. <laughs> I just came for a vacation. Mm -hmm. and so tell us that story. <laughs> yes, tell us. So we could correct Steve's apocryphal story. <laughs> well, I had studied theology before. So by the time I got to seminary and I was studying at the Venerable English College in Rome, when I was there, I was far advanced in the theology. And so therefore, to fill up my formation, I had to go and do further studies. So my bishop then asked me to study the liturgy at Sant Anselmo, which is the church's um, institute for higher liturgical studies. So I was beginning my studies there, and I found myself the only seminarian, and all of my classmates were either priests or nuns. And here I was in, in, a, in a class, and they'd call you out. I mean, goodness, it was, it was hard. You, you'd have texts in Latin and Greek. And you get called on, read that, read this, translate this, translate that. Not just obviously into English, but translate from Greek or Latin into Italian in front of all of your classmates. And here's me, a seminarian. All these fellows are, are priests and, and the nuns that were there as well. So I found myself with all of my classmates being priests, and they had the same troubles and trials that we all do when we're studying. And I, I got to know some of these guys very well. And just so happens that one of them was a priest of Bridgeport and said to me, I've got a really nice summer assignment in a beautiful parish. You're not doing anything. You're a seminarian. It's the beginning of the summer. Why don't you just Every come and... says that about seminarians, <laughs> even though it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, come and, come and visit. Why don't you come and stay? We've got a great, you know, a, a great place and I know that, that you would enjoy it. So I thought, well, um, why not? I'll, I'll come over and see. And, and that was actually in Richfield. St. Mary's in Ridgefield. And so I arrived and it was a beautiful experience. And the, the experience of meeting with the people of Ridgefield changed my life, frankly. But it wasn't something that I necessarily picked up at the time. At the time, it was just a pleasant experience, just a pleasant vocational experience. Here I was, seminarian in a beautiful parish, in a beautiful town in the United States. And the people were friendly and, and, and pleasant. All was very exciting. But I couldn't get them out of my mind when I left to go back to my studies in Rome. And over a long period of time, I just heard the Lord gently say, I want you to serve here, which is not what I wanted to hear in the slightest, because I was just about to be ordained a deacon. And the consequence, I think any bishop, Bishop, you can speak to this, of course, much better than I can, for any bishop, the idea of a seminarian at that late stage, suddenly saying, well, do you know, I think the Lord might be calling me somewhere else, is usually a bad thing. Usually something's gone wrong. Uh, and I was in this situation whereby I could discern that this, I was as sure as I could be, that this was the Lord calling me. And yet it would mean an unknown journey, an unknown um, trajectory as a consequence. And I relied, I suppose, on so many more people being able to discern whether this was in fact the Lord's call. And you have to put it into the hands of your superiors. I think that's, I guess, the nature of obedience. You have to go to those people 
into whose charge you've been placed, in my case at the time, my rector, the spiritual director, and then later on, the vocations director, and of course, yourself, Bishop, and you have to be obedient to the answers that you get. And that's not easy, that's not easy. it's not always comfortable for a lot of people. And vocation, I think, you just mentioned that that's a lot of priests' stories. I think everybody has a somewhat knotty pathway, and perhaps that knotty pathway is um, a sign of authenticity. Mm -hmm. If it's too easy, then there's something that you're not really engaging with. There's not been the breaking down that Catholic formation in particular requires you, if you like, to allow yourself to be broken apart in order to be rebuilt. Or to get to uh, try as best you can to subject your ego, as you said, and desires to the will of God. And that's part of the dying and rising that we're all called to be, both disciples as well as ordained clerics. Yeah, I think some of the some of the most fruitful moments of ministry are the unexpected ones, precisely because you're not in control, just as you describe, right? You just receive yes. the grace of whatever the Lord wants to give you. And your coming here opened up a venue that, Steve, you were talking about, which is this allowing us an opportunity to really explore the evangelical power of beauty. So I'm going to set the stage and then we're going to ask you a question. Um, our listeners have always heard us talk about this often. And there's more than three transcendentals, human transcendental, but these are the three principal ones, truth, beauty, and goodness. And if you kind of look at the person very simplistically, the human person as mind, heart, and spirit, that parallels truth, beauty, and goodness. Right? So the whole idea is to encounter fully the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord doesn't want 25% of us or 40% of us. He wants 100% of us. And there's a lot of misnomer in the church now about having a personal encounter, singular, with Jesus Christ. No, absolutely not. There are multiple encounters every day in the person of Jesus Christ, in and through the church, which is the community of believers. So we have gone through a period of time in the life of our church where we have really emphasized, for better or for worse, the intellectual, understand the faith, which is great, great, wonderful. That's trying to correct a culture, perhaps before the Vatican Council, that overemphasized heart and will, but not necessarily the understanding of the faith, but at the detriment of beauty and goodness. And you may say, well, Bishop, why, why would you even say that? Well, it's because in many ways, you've heard the phrase, Father Clark, I know about Jesus, but I don't know Jesus, right? You can know about Jesus. Even the devil knows about the catechism. He could quote sacred scripture. In fact, he probably has it memorized. But he, he doesn't know him, the Lord, obviously. So, so that was the trajectory of the church. And then add to that technology for our young people. And you're, you're going to talk about how the guild and is going to really serve young adults. When you add that to young adult in the world in which we live, which we've talked about is very sterile, right? It's very information driven. It's overstimulated. And most young adults are really tired, running from place to place. Now suddenly you have in the other two pieces of the human life, the heart and the will, you have a deep desire to do good and a heart that's looking for something to feed it, to inspire it, to encourage it, to move it, so that you could desire to learn more about the faith, not as an obligation, but as a death. That's why I think beauty is extraordinarily important. And that is why I'm delighted that you have now, you are the leader both of the guild and the oratory. So what are you going to do? That's my <laughs> question. <laughs> All right, now they set this great stage, tell us. <laughs> well, I think of course, and the, this goes without saying, it should go without saying, that my, my first task is to discern the Lord's will in all of this. Because, of course, we have the beautiful teaching of the church, but how does that live out on a local level? And we're always trying to discern, okay, well, these are the principles. How does that affect my life? And what's that look like in Connecticut? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the beauties of the, of the priesthood is, is being really rooted to a certain people to a certain identifiable grouping of the people of God and listening very carefully then to the needs of people living in Fairfield County is one of, one of my key tasks. But that question of beauty is very interesting 
Because often people will say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And that's actually not true at all. It's not in the eye of the beholder. Because what's meant by that frequently is that beauty is whatever I find beautiful, that I'm in control of what beauty is. In fact, beauty is not in my control. Beauty is God himself. And therefore, what I can perceive in my eye is something that God desires to communicate with me. And therefore, there are so many different ways in which God wishes to enter into the human heart, how he wishes to propose himself to the human heart. It means that I can start anything and it's going to, in some way, lead to an encounter with Christ. The question is, what sort of an encounter is it going to lead to? And part of um, bringing a lot of very talented and interesting people together um, under the umbrella of the guild is to discern w which ways work best and to always have in mind this idea of excellence in all that we do. So whether it's sacred art, whether it's music, that we're always looking to do things, not just, okay, that's a, that's a decent job, but an excellent job. Mm -hmm. Because I think that makes the face of Christ more visible. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. You and I have spoken often about providing multiple opportunities that can be offered to our people, all our people, including the priests and the deacons and the religious, besides the, the in addition to the lay faithful, multiple opportunities to have God's grace engage the heart because there will be multiple ways that can happen. I'll give you a very, very brief story. It just happened to me. On, um, when I was driving down to Washington for the USCCB, um, it was Tuesday morning. And of course, Monday we had the terrible rains here in Connecticut and it was just all over and the roads were a disaster. But anyway, seeing it there. And I was on the New Jersey Turnpike of all places, driving down. And for whatever reason, Monday there were just a lot of challenges. It's just it's typical in the life of all of us. You have days that are just like, ugh. All right, that, that was Monday. Ugh. And I'm driving, and I'm, I just passed Heightstown, 8A, right? And I am fiddling around with my radio, and I couldn't get the blasted thing to work on Pandora. And I look up, and in the midst of this clouded sky, there is a beautiful, clear, distinct rainbow that only lasted about 30 seconds. And I tell you this because it was beautiful. It was a natural expression of beauty. It's God's gift. But it, in that moment for me, it gave me such an overwhelming sense of the consolation of God's presence in my life. It's like, get over it. I'm here. There are clouds. I'm here. Just take a breath and keep driving. And that may sound almost like a simplistic uh, experience but in many ways beauty is going to be in the natural and supernatural order right so you're going to host pilgrimages we're going to talk about that and travel with young adults and let architecture speak to them sacred music and all its variety so in a sense what you are providing and and everyone that you're working with are opportunities for God's grace, in God's time, and in God's choosing to touch somebody's heart. Is that a fair way to put it? Absolutely, Bishop. And I think that the arts are fascinating to observe because they're an ongoing conversation. So when you study them from the outside, say you want to learn more about architecture, you can do so on a very superficial level. But there's also a much deeper level which is open to you if you choose to go down that road. There's a a discussion between artists how best to present these forms when architects you're thinking of the, the beauty of a gothic building why is a gothic building more satisfying or arguably more suitable mm -hmm. to the liturgy than a classical building that's an open dialogue and you'll have some architects who will argue one way others that will argue another way but in so doing, what they're all striving for is this idea of, of excellence, this perfect building, which of course is not achievable in our lifetime. The only perfect building is the, is the kingdom of heaven that, that actually God is the author of, God is the architect. I mean, Revelation describes heaven as the, you know, the city, the 
gilded city with the gates of pearl, um, all of those things. So we know that there is an ideal and we have to, to, to uncover it. So pilgrimages is a way of saying what is already in our built environment. What do we already have here in Fairfield County that we perhaps walk by and don't really access very deeply because we take it for granted. Think of our cathedral, a building which so many of us know so well, but how much do we know its history? How much do we know the, the different design details that point ever more clearly to Christ? And how is it that when we um, make renovations or additions to these buildings, how is it going to enhance right. that encounter? Absolutely. You know, we'll talk at, at the break, we could talk about the specifics, because I think our listeners really need to know what is up your sleeve, if I may say. Oh, I see. What you're planning to do, right, offer, which I think is extremely important. What I want you to just, if you will, just speak a bit about, and I'll, I'll preface the question with an observation. <clears throat> Symbol, symbols, and the power of symbols have, have been, um, in many ways in the secular world, have been set aside for the, when I'm going to say the explicated, the vernacular. So we explain everything. We don't allow something to just sit in front of us and speak to us. Now, I would think, perhaps you may disagree, but I think we'd be of like mind to say the symbols, liturgically in particular, are meant to speak almost in a non-cognitive way, but they still speak powerfully. And part of what we need to recapture is the power of symbol in so many different ways, right? Because the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is true, real, substantial, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But the, the liturgical celebration and all the symbols, that just, even the, the house in which the, the house of God speaks to us in different ways. And we just live in a world that just wants to run by that all. Is that a fair, is that a fair critique or not? Bishop, I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, I, I would just emphasize the fact that the liturgy, the power of it is nonverbal language not information about Christ, but Christ himself unfolding himself before our very eyes. And in that sense, one of the observations that you often receive as a priest is, well, I just need to understand what's going on, Father. And often my response to that is, well, I don't understand what's going on, and I don't think that I can either, because what's going on is a mystery, and symbol, I think, is the way, the shorthand, if you like, to to explain and expound what mystery is all about. Mystery is, is not a riddle. It's not something we can't know anything about. It's what we can know something about, but not the entirety. And that, of course, is our experience of God himself. God desires for us to know as much of him as he wishes to reveal to right. us. Right. Um, right. And so, therefore, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise that the liturgy uses this nonverbal communication um, in such an effective way. There's really nothing else, no other human activity like the sacred liturgy, no other things that humans do that speak so eloquently of God, the source and summit of our Christian life as Vatican II describes it. And just for example, to to go a bit deeper, you know, there's a lot of, we did the Synod on Synodality, you know, all the parishes, most of the parishes participated. And one of the themes that came up over and over again is liturgy um, and people's desire for it to be celebrated be- beautifully, reverently. I'm going to use the word transcendently. They want, to be, they want to be engaged in the mind. They want to be engaged in the heart. They want to be inspired to do something coming out of Mass. And what are the things they mentioned? They mentioned music. They mentioned the celebrant. They mentioned... Even things like cleanlinesses of churches, the beautifulness, how beautiful vestments are, um, how things are prepared, posture at, at when you come into church. A number of people said, you know, we walk into church and it's no different than when you walk into a theater. But there is an essential difference between coming into church and coming to a theater, right? So those are insights, I think, that people are beginning to, to verbalize that are pointing to what this mission is that there is a desire deeper than people's hearts when you really give them a chance to reflect, that they want to have the experience of entering into 
whatever the liturgical celebration is, fully engaged, not just mentally engaged, fully engaged. So that's going to be how you are going to help us to do this. That's quite a task, Bishop. Yes, because, yes, absolutely. Someone <laughs> has to do it. <laughs> there are certain key words that really come up again and again in this arena. And authenticity is perhaps the one that comes up for me most frequently. And looking at the demographic, it happens and occurs m more frequently the the, the way that you go down the generations. So apparently, according to the official figures, I'm a millennial. Which Are is you? A, I am. And much a surprise to me. I'm a Neanderthal. Keep going. <laughs> as to anybody else. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's, I think perhaps, Bishop, that I'm a relatively young priest, but there are other priests that will tell me that the first time that you realize that you're baptizing the babies of mm. the people of the generation below you is a moment where you realize, oh, Things have changed somewhat. So mm. I'm now starting to baptize the babies of what's called Gen Z. But as we go down there from, um, the, I think it's Gen Y, which is after the baby boomers, to the millennials, to Gen Z, increasingly there's this desire for authenticity. It doesn't matter in a way what you're presenting. As long as you are authentic, that carries a lot of weight. So you can, you can challenge young people with with concepts and ideas that are not easy to decipher, not easy to pick up. As long as you are authentic about it, as long as it means something to you, then then they pick up on that like it's electricity. And that's something which which we can convey. It has a huge, huge evangelistic power. Without a doubt. And if I may, before we go to break, you can then see how devastating it is when the younger generations see leaders inauthentic because not only are they evacuating their own ability to lead but they call into ill repute the communities they represent that is in part why institutions are in crisis now all across the board in the western world institutions of every form and shape that that there are more and more people who are asking for authenticity from the, the leaders of those institutions including the church, and at times are disappointed that they don't see it. And therefore, that becomes a crisis of community. And that's something that, again, we need to re-engage people, to your point, to, to see authenticity on every level of life. And so when we come back from the break, we can talk about specific ways that the Guild will help do that through beauty. So this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network, and His Excellency is speaking with Father Michael Clark, the Rector of the Guild of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, and we'll be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. 
His Excellency Bishop Caggiano is speaking with Father Michael Clark, the Rector of the Guild of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, and I will just turn it right over to you, Excellency. Well, yeah, Father Clark, so everyone is anxious to hear how, where are you going with this? What will you be doing and what are you going, are you going to offer? So tell us. It's a surprisingly hard question, Bishop, for this reason. So we're dealing with the arts and human beings get involved in the arts when words fail them. That's mm -hmm. the reason that we express ourselves in this way. So one of the most difficult things to do with the arts is to explain in words what cannot be explained in words. Nevertheless, there is, a, there is information that I certainly would love to share with, uh, with, with the listeners um, about our programs because there's so much going on and we are going to be in your neighborhood. I think that's the, the, the line to take away. We are going to be in your neighborhood. We've got a beautiful campus in Georgetown, Connecticut, right in the heart of the diocese. You yourself, Bishop, described it as the heart of the diocese when you inaugurated the guild. And that provides people with a place that some of the programs will um, be established at, but by no means all. So we're on the road, and one of the one of the apostolates that I'm most excited about, most proud about, is one called Heart to Heart, which is the deliberate recalling of Cardinal Newman's motto, Core Ad Core. And Heart to Heart is a night of praise, worship, Eucharistic adoration, and it's designed to showcase excellence in contemporary music, which is one of the, I wouldn't want to call it the dark arts, but it's, it's one thing which has been difficult for us as the church to tether. How do we make contemporary music gel with our Catholic identity? Because our brothers and sisters who are Protestants do it so well. And one of the things that I've observed is there's a longing in contemporary music. It's a real heartfelt longing for Christ, longing to be filled. And for many of our brothers and sisters, there is almost like there's not the recognition that that longing is fulfilled in the Eucharist. It's actually fulfilled in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So we're trying to, if you like, present the longing and also the Eucharist at the very same time. So too. the question and answer, in a sense. Yes, absolutely. So those mm -hmm. nights which will be going around the diocese, we're starting September 24th at the Church of the Holy Name of Jesus. Stanford. In Stanford, that's right. And... We'll be there for three months, and it's going to be on a Saturday night once a month for three months. Then we'll move on the next location. So if our listeners want to come, what time does it start? It starts at 6.30 p.m. Um, on Saturday, September 24th in Stamford. And the, the time may well change in different locations because it depends upon when the vigil mass is. Right, of course, absolutely. But it will go on from there, and there will be an opportunity for people to experience the beauty of the music, but also the Sacrament of Reconciliation mm -hmm. and Adoration as I'll well. I'll be there. Thank you. We look forward to having Can you. Can I bring my stole with me? Even better. <laughs> so that's one of our very exciting programs. But on a, on a different level, that's more kind of local level, we're starting an art school in Georgetown on Saturday mornings. And that will get going. There's a few taster sessions before Christmas mm -hmm. that will go, get going in the in the new year where we'll be teaching kids about sacred art, but also the practical skills as well. So not only are they going to be studying these beautiful works of art, but also the techniques as to how they were made. So I'm very excited to see what they'll we'll come up with. Um, so we've got some beautiful programs going on there, um, things that are going around the diocese. Um, a lot of pilgrimages are coming up. I know that that's very dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're organizing pilgrimages that will go around to the churches of historical interest. So people will be able to check out our website, which will be launching very soon, which is going to be at jesusguild.org. And on our website, you'll have beautifully pre presented flyers for all of these different events. Mm -hmm. We've also got a tour of the Art Gallery at Fairfield University coming up on October 15th. And uh, that's another way that we'll be able to meet some of the guild members, um, particularly the artists who are involved in the, the different groupings. But perhaps zoning out for, for a moment, the guild is, is like a honeycomb in its structure. And it's a network of people that are connected together. Um, we have two words, and there's always, there's always jargon in the church, isn't there? The two words 
uh, sodality and apostolate. So we have sodalities, which are groupings of people, and those groupings of people, either laity and clergy or a mix, undergo and, and take care of the apostolates of the guild. So that can be one-off events, it can be recurring events, um, it depends on, on what that necessarily that, that, um, that structure is, uh, is engaged with. But we have, um, thanks to your decree and thanks to the way that you've organized the guild, four pillars of concern, and they are art, architecture, music, and literature. So under those four pillars, and our website will make this very clear, you'll see the different options for engaging with the guild's work across the diocese. So it's going to be a very busy few months. So then the key place where a person can come to be updated would be the new website that's it going will to be. be. It will so be. So repeat it again. What's the address? JesusTheGuild.org. Okay. And then there'll be a link from our diocesan website too. So the information for the guild will be on ours. So if a person forgets, they could just come to our diocesan website and get the information Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Right. So in a sense, um, your pilgrimage, my, my emphasis on pilgrimage and, and your willingness, and I'm grateful to make this a piece of the guild work, is animated from one basic um, observation I've had in my own life. And that is... Um, to break the ordinary routine we have helps dispose you to receive what God wants to give you. And in some sense, now of course, in life, God forbid a tragedy, a suffering, an accident breaks the ordinary routine. And it's not the sort of thing that you would say, oh my gosh, this is going to be a moment of grace, but it can and often is, right? Because if you're sitting in your lounge chair because your your your, your uh, leg is broken, immobilizes you, so that the activities you normally do you don't do. But that's time that the Lord can speak to you, right? In your suffering, because that's ultimately could be redemptive anyway. But for this, I think because of the pace of our modern life, which is so busy, so frenetic, and therefore very hard to focus. I think for our young people and young adults, and that's different, right? I mean, teenagers going on a pilgrimage is very different from young adults. And when I did World Youth Day and brought them both, Lord have mercy. Thank God they invented aspirin. But you taking them on pilgrimage, breaking the routine, you're kind of like breaking the soil. So that God's grace, depending on what touches their heart during the day or during a few days or during a week, if we go abroad, which eventually, please God, we will be doing. That, I think, is, is just a tremendous gift to give that person or any person an opportunity. That's really kind of the reasoning. Again, the holy sites, could you, you take 25 young people to the Holy Land, they'll never read scripture again the same way. You take them to Rome and you walk the streets of the martyrs, they will never see the church the same way again. Is that fair to say? Absolutely fair. And I think that we are beings that need our bodies to be in certain places. So pilgrimage is not just taking the mind somewhere, but you actually have to use your legs and walk and go right. to a different place to really right. break out right. of mm -hmm. routines and perhaps even ways of thinking that are, are a block to that relationship right. with Christ. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that we all enjoy vacations as a break from our routine mm -hmm. to recharge this is something different it's not a vacation but it fulfills a similar function in that sense of being out of the ordinary time constraints out of the necessarily the people that you uh, often associate with in order that actually god has a look in for a moment and that's why we all kind of need, really, to have those experiences of pilgrimages. It should be something that, if one thing that we could learn from our Muslim brothers and sisters is the idea that pilgrimage is essential right. to, to Christian life. Exactly. And perhaps we did at one stage, because I think pilgrimage was more of a feature of Christian life in the past. And also the, the redemptive quality of pilgrimage. People would go on pilgrimage for others. And if you couldn't go yourself because you were too busy, Sometimes you pay for someone to go on pilgrimage for you. Right. And there is a, also a sacrifice that's made in that. And that could be, of course, financial. But it's also a big sacrifice of time. Mm -hmm. 
And whenever we make those kinds of sacrifices, what we find is that that if we empty ourselves out, God fills us up. Right. Oh, without a doubt. You think of the Camino. Yes. Right? The Camino is... Wouldn't that be great if we did the Camino with oh the... Oh, my God. I was... Scale. You know, I haven't, I've mentioned this to you, I think. Before I was transferred to Bridgeport, that was already arranged. There were going to be 12 young adults and I were going on eight days of the Camino, and they were making... They were making a video testimony of their own journeys of faith. I would love to do that. Yes. Before I get too old which we're getting close to, okay? <laughs> I will be in rehab for two weeks after eight days of the Camino. So we should do this relatively soon. The other is, when I was in Ireland in May, cabin, I led the, uh, the retreat for priests uh, in, for, from the Diocese of Meath. Um, in the conversation that came up, and of course, I, I don't exactly remember what it was called, but the penitential island that the Irish go to to remain in vigil, walking. Oh, is it Loch Derg? Yes, Loch yes. Derg. And to remain up awake all night. Why? I touched myself, why would you do this? <laughs> why would you do this? And one Irish priest, brilliant, older man, just a lovely, lovely, lovely man, he said to me, there's only one reason you would do it, is because when the, when the dawn comes, the very first thing you do is you go to confession. And having gone through that experience of walking awake all night, he said every inhibition, prohibition, reluctance to tell your sins in their fullness and in their ugliness is, is gone. He said it is the most life-altering exp life experience to just be able to be so, quote-unquote, broken down that you can quote unquote, be built up by grace. He said he's had just, he himself did it. It was just the most remarkable confession he has ever had in his life. And I thought to myself, my goodness. So pilgrimage is meant to build us up by getting us out of the ordinary to introduce the extraordinary, right? Absolutely. Well, Bishop, also, I need to say, we Celts are quite intense. <laughs> now, I know that you might hear my dulcet tones and think, oh, well, he speaks the Queen's, I should say the King's English. Yes. <laughs> yes. So therefore, he must be one of these Anglo-Saxons. But in fact, I come from the Celtic fringe. And so really, I'm, I'm a cousin of, uh, of our Irish brothers and sisters. And, uh, and we Celts really are very intense, but also stubborn. It's one of our hallmarks. So I think that this idea of doing something which is hard actually kind of comes naturally to a people that lives on the edge of the world, literally lives on the edge of the world, um, and a world that's not always uh, welcoming and inviting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that's very interesting as well for, for us, particularly in New England, to look to Ireland and England as places where our spirituality has its well source. Oh, yeah, of course. And one of the things that I would love to do is to have an annual pilgrimage to England. Maybe we'll have England and Ireland, I don't know yet. But the reason particularly for England is one thing I've been observed since I've been in the United States is that American Catholics don't know the history. And the history of the Catholic Church in the United States is intimately connected not to Rome so much, but to England. The first bishop was consecrated in England in the country home called Lulworth Castle of a recusant Catholic family, ones who at great personal cost had retained the Catholic faith over years and years. And he was not consecrated at Propaganda Fide in Rome or wherever you might be. He, he chose to be consecrated in England. And in fact, that gives, therefore, I would argue, the American church, some of that DNA of the English martyrs. And so their story becomes our story, this idea of a struggle against power, which is also the, the, the history of the Catholic Church in the United States as well, struggling for identity right. um, and acceptance. And part, of, and part of the difficulty we have now experienced is that many of us are no longer struggling against power, but we share the power. Mm. And there's a great danger there. Well, you, you were speaking earlier, Bishop, about institutions and authenticity. Absolutely. When we adopt the powerful structures and we um, enjoy that exercise of power, then all the more so we're held to 
a higher standard, and we should be. You know, I one of the most poignant moments I remember in a pilgrimage, other than the Holy Land, was when I did go to England, and in the Cathedral of Canterbury, mm. and the guide, and I presume it's true, pointed out the spot where Thomas Becket was killed. Yes. And then from the vantage point, as I remember moving around, you could see the, I guess it's the chair of Augustine, in the, and it just sits there in this huge expanse. And I was thinking to myself, my goodness gracious, it's, it looked lonely, but it also looked firm because the, the cathedral was built as a Catholic cathedral. And of course, then when the Church of England split and all the rest of it. And I thought to myself, that, I mean, the, the martyrdoms and the and and all that has happened since, but the chair remains, see, but Christ still remains, right? He's going to lead his church. And please God, not in my lifetime, but perhaps there could be re reunion, reconciliation among Christians, because that too is evacuating on some level our, ab our ability to be a witness to a divided society, because you can hear them snickering. Well, you people can't get your act together. Why are you asking us to get our act together? Complicated question, theological question. I have no answers to those questions, but I can hope, right? I can hope. The other thing is, so I've heard criticisms. Can you imagine people offering criticisms in the church? It's unbelievable. I've heard criticisms, and the criticism is of the guild. Well, this is just really an exercise, Bishop, of just reintroducing just the traditional aspects of the church. You know, so this is all about Gregorian chant, this is all about Latin mass, this is all about... Now, obviously, that is not true, right? Because the very fact that the, the evenings of praise are contemporary music and finding its proper place. So I, I'm not sure you want to say anything about that, but I think people should understand that the Guild is beauty in the full tradition of the church, right? What do you think? If it's beautiful, we're interested is the buzz line, I guess. And I think, Bishop, that learning from from you, learning from the way that, that you propose the Catholic faith to the people of Fairfield County, I've observed of you that you see that there are different roads to Christ. You've spoken of that very eloquently in, in a number of areas. And so anything which is good, anything which is which works, then I think we should be interested in that. And we shouldn't exclude. So just as much as um, we may well have the traditional forms and they, they nurtured the saints, they can't, be, they can't be things which are inherently bad, but there are also new expressions that arise in, in our church family and we need to be able to celebrate those as well. I don't think we have to make a choice between them. The most important Catholic word is and, in my opinion. So I think that those examples, and as the guild unfolds, and it's still at a very early stage, then there'll oh be God. more more examples where the guild will, I hope, please God, give a lead to, uh, and just a, a kind of shot in the arm, really, to those um, men and women who are really doing sterling work in parishes to try and foster music, to foster the liturgy, sure. all those things, in whatever, in whatever form, in whatever form. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It's just it's just a few months old. Yes. Right. So people have to realize you're really constructing. You're just at the very earliest stages of giving birth to the guild with the board. Right. So, I mean, it will take a while to really begin to see a flower, but it will happen. It Build, will happen. It, building the plane whilst flying it. Exactly. Is what I have two other questions very quickly, if you don't mind. The first is uh, talk to let our listeners know about uh, vestments. There's a piece to this, too, is there not? about the creation of vestments? Oh, well, Bishop, yes, there is. So we are, I think, very um, privileged to have a number of um, people interested in vestments in our diocese. And in particular, we have a very skilled tailor and she operates under the name of Sacra Indumenta. And she is an amazingly skilled lady and her understanding of the history of vestments and how they enhance our the beauty is so important for us to 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 really understand it's not really appropriate in my opinion to to dress for mass as if it doesn't matter it matters immensely 
And why would we give of our worst to Christ when we could give of our best to Christ? So I think vestments is not just about fancy clothes. Uh, and it's not really about detachment from the people. It's actually detachment from the self for the priest. The more that I don't look like myself, the more that I'm wearing vestments that I would not wear out in the street. Actually, I think that's more helpful because people then can see Christ as opposed to seeing me. I don't really want people to see me. And so vestments, there is a, a philosophy behind that. And the more that we can um, talk about that, produce articles about it, and actually give examples, um, the better, I think. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. The other is, it's just an observation that actually has just crossed my mind, perhaps cognitively for the first time, when you were describing contemporary music. And I kind of said before, it's, it's, it raises the question, and the Eucharist is the answer, but in many ways, you know, a very dear friend of mine in Stanford introduced me to K-Love in the car, which you get on Pandora, right? And it's Christian, contemporary Christian, overwhelmingly Protestant artists. But it's Christian, obviously. So I listen to it because everything else depresses me greatly. Except Veritas. Oh, except Veritas. <laughs> Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And um, it's my time to kind of unwind in the car. Rosary and if this time for, for music. And very tough. And um, what I've come to realize is much of the music is a story of personal redemption. That it's a lot of broken lives, a lives that have hit bottom, who have seen the darkness, whether it's suffering or sinfulness or, or the tragedies of life. And Christ is the light. So Christ was the one who came to them in their hours of darkness and gave them hope. And I think most of the time, these artists are speaking very personally. Right? And for us as Catholics, we have the same experience. But we do have the Eucharist, which is entering into the only suffering that really matters, which is Christ's suffering and the only death that really has eternal value, which is his. And then we have hope. So when you marry the two together, it's, it's, it's like the secret sauce, right? That is when it all works. Is that, would you? We're looking for the secret sauce. And I suppose that's it. We, because of the structure that, that you have given to us, we're able to, to experiment to some degree and to work out what works, what doesn't work. Let's mm -hmm. see if this works or not. Mm -hmm. But... It's interesting about contemporary music particularly, it has a great power because it's contemporary, because it's of the time. It resonates with what people are experiencing right now. If we look at secular music, it changes all the time and it depends on the mood, the zeitgeist of what's going on in the world. So music during the lockdown was very different from music now. And we see a lot of aspirational music now and sort of the idea of people getting out and about it's reflected in the culture reflected in the music and for us to to bring christ into that to talk about our relationship with with god and to put that to music in a way which really hits the the pulse of now is something that we've not been very good at in the church actually what we are very good at in the church is that we know what works we have these tried and tested methods god has given us ways to uh, to, to access him and we're, we're grateful for those and we should it's it's a, a crime to throw those away it's a crime to throw away Gregorian chant for example the native music of our Roman right but in having that doesn't mean that it can only be Gregorian chant there are other forms that are equally powerful um, but I suppose one of the the challenges then is how how not to make it ephemeral how not to make it something which you can just throw away listen to and then the next thing comes along. How is it really going to um, change my heart? How is it going to make me go deeper? It has to resonate. It needs to keep re-echoing in your heart. You know, even within the church itself, if you, because there are multiple rites, as we all know. When I had uh, faculties for the Maronite rite, and I would celebrate mass in the Maronite rite, and for our listeners, um, it's the only rite that I'm aware of in the Catholic communion that the words of institution are in Aramaic, which I memorized phonetically. I can't read Aramaic, but I memorized them phonetically. So you're actually saying the words that 
more than likely the Lord himself said on earth at the Last Supper. But anyway, that music has a, a, a tonality to it that it's very hard for me to describe in words, but I found it very um, engaging, fascinating. But it speaks to a history of a people. Yeah. Well, right? th th there's, a, there's a theory that whenever, for example, in the Sacred Scriptures, when our Lord reads from Isaiah, and it's, you know, he goes up and proclaims, and you think, okay, was he reading it? Or is he, in fact, singing it? Because in the Semitic world, to enunciate a text, even if um, it seems like they're reading it, there's, there's tone to it. It's, it can't really be done without singing, without putting in some sense music to it. And I wonder, actually, if that's you know, the common thread, if you like. Think about how the Quran is recited by our Muslim brothers and sisters. When they recite that, it's, it's got a lyric to it. It's got a poetry, but it also has tone to it. Um, similarly, when the Hebrew scriptures are read out, there's, 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 a, there's a distinct musical quality to it. Gregorian chant is our version of the same thing, in a way. It's lifting the text to tone. And I think it's, it's the same family. But th there's, again, it's that A word, it's authenticity. And so, in a way, you're keying into that tradition, which the Lord himself gives us the, the example of when he proclaims the sacred scriptures. He's, he's giving voice to it. And, you know, that's it. The word... Um, is is the source of all of all life, or if I may just kind of conclude that thought from the cross when he quoted the psalm, was he saying it, or was he singing it? And if he sang it, just as you described, he was beginning. He set the model for the Christians who sang the psalms on their way to death in the early church. It's a fascinating idea. It leads much to reflect on. What a conversation. We're going to have to have you back, Father, as, as you, as you uh, launch new initiatives. You should come on and, and, and tell us about them. This conversation could go on for a couple hours at because least. We have to land the plane. <laughs> if, oh, I think he I, just landed it. <laughs> it was a very soft landing. Oh, yeah. The air traffic control said, you're done. <laughs> Only because of the time constraints of media. But, um, but we, will, we will have you back. Uh, we're going to take one more break and come back with a listener question. You're listening to Let Me Be Frank on Veritas Catholic Network. Hi there, this is Lauren Doyle from Restless, and I'm here to invite young adults ages 21 to 40 to a dance and pizza party hosted by the Church of the Holy Spirit on Saturday, October 1st from 7 to 10 p.m. Join me, Father Joseph Gill, and the rest of the Restless crew as we celebrate reaching our 100th episode. The night will feature a beginner ballroom dance lesson and then transition into dance party fun with opportunities to support your favorite local Catholic radio station. Yes, you guessed it, Veritas Catholic Network. When you're not dancing, enjoy pizza, beer, cider, and wine. Tickets to the event are available for $20, which you can purchase by emailing secretary at holyspiritstanford.org. The price increases to $30 at the door, so get your tickets today. We hope to see you for what is sure to be a great night on Saturday, October 1st at Holy Spirit in Stamford, Connecticut. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank uh, with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency, I think you're going to like this question today. So it, uh, the question came in from a young man who was studying at your alma mater, Regis High School. Mm -hmm. And he would like to know, what some of your fondest memories from Regis are, and he asks, how did the school help you figure out your vocation? Wow, that's two questions. <laughs> the first- uh, He's it, from Regis, so he's an overachiever. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a collage of memories. It was, um, well, certainly the friends I made, I made, which have become lifetime friends. It's working on the newspaper. It's the long hours preparing for debate. It was studying Greek for the Homeric Academy. It was riding the subway, going through Greek flashcards. It was uh, biology class in that upper classroom that looked like a cave. It was, <laughs> it, it, it's just a collage of experiences that formed me in ways that I can't fully describe in words, kind of following the theme of what we talked about. As for my vocation, is very simple. Um, when I was young, I've said often on this podcast that the Dominican Sisters of Kentucky 
were a formative presence, in part because the priests who were assigned to my parish were not. Were not. Um, if anything, they gave me every reason not to be a priest. And I say that very honestly. Okay. So when I went to Regis, you spoke, Father Clark, of authenticity. I saw that authenticity in the Jesuit priests who were my teachers. Father Kelly, Father Callahan, tremendous men, authentic, faithful, intelligent, engaging, caring. So it, it presented an image of priesthood for me, for the first time up close and personal, that was inspiring to me. And I think that was an essential piece of my vocational discernment. Awesome, awesome. So if you have a question for Bishop Frank, you can send it into one, send it into us over social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so is Veritas Catholic Network. And we would like to thank Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. And Father Michael Clark, thank you so much for joining us today. So tell us again where folks can go to learn more about the Guild and to get involved. I think the obvious answer to that is come and meet us. Come and meet us on September 24th, the Church of the Holy Name in Stamford. We'll be there from 6.30 p.m. until late, and there'll be people around that will be able to welcome you there, and you'll be able to, to have, if any of this makes sense to you, if any of this really kind of piques your interest, then come meet us. And we're also always available in Georgetown too. So come stop by for coffee and cookies. We've always got those on the go as well. So, so that's this, the invitation. This Saturday, uh, September 24th at 6.30 at Holy Name of Jesus, it's going to be contemporary style music and Eucharistic adoration and confession. And you'll be there, Excellency. Yes. Sounds like, sounds yes. awesome. Yes, sounds awesome. yes. Okay, so before we go, Excellency, would you please give us yes, a blessing? Yes, I'm going to de delegate for the clerk if you would give us a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Steve, I will see you next week, my friend. See you later.